Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a, a real honor and pleasure to be here today to participate in this uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, event. And let me tell you a little story before, before I start. Um, in advance of preparing my presentation, Svi gave me four instructions. And let me read them to you. One is, talk about the extensions of Bob's work in the financial literature since the Nobel Prize. Talk about how Bob's research has influenced my own. Use no mathematics. <laughs> and do it all in 20 minutes. <laughs> so, so eager to participate, I said, no problem. <laughs> Not a problem. Well, later on, I had second thoughts. And, and I, I said to Sisvi, could I have five more minutes? And he said, sure. No problem. So here it goes. So I'm going to talk about Robert Merton's seminal insights. And it's called Revisited 20 Years Later because 20 years ago, I was invited to write um, an essay on the contributions of the Black Scholes and Merton option pricing model to finance the academic finance world and the, and the financial industry. So 20 years later, I am now going to reflect on the seminal insights within that paper and add to them the contingent claims model, the intertemporal capital asset pricing model, the ICE cap -M. And surprisingly, with uh, Eugene Fama in the audience, I'm going to make a connection of Bob's insights to market efficiency. But that's only if I have time. And that's my most current uh, research um, agenda or topic. OK. So how can I do this in 20 minutes? As his student, and to honor Bob, and to show the profound impact his insights have had on my own professional career, I'm going to restrict my discussion of uh, the extensions of his work to the research, to my research. Okay, so you know, the research that I will talk about are, is or are the HGM model, asset price bubbles, the reduced form model for credit risk, and I'm going to compare that to Merton's uh, contingent claims analysis, or sometimes called the structural model. And I'm going to talk about equilibrium with bubbles, liquidity risk, and trading constraints. That's a mouthful. And then if we have time, like I said, I want to talk about market efficiency. And simply stated, um, my life's work can be characterized as a modest attempt to extend and to apply Robert Merton's seminal insights to better understand financial markets. So I am truly a Mertonian. OK. So let's start. I'm going to start with the Black Scholes and Merton option pricing model. So I want to look at this, too. So I'm going to just stand to the side. OK. Now, the BSM model provides a blueprint, as was discussed by Svi, uh, for the pricing and hedging of derivatives on arbitrary collections of assets. Now, as a model, a model is a mathematical abstraction of some phenomenon. And in this case, it's a financial market. And a model is uniquely determined by its assumptions. The implications of the model are just mathematical deductions based on the assumptions. So to understand a model and to understand my extensions of his models, we have to talk about the assumptions. So I'm going to concentrate on those. And here is a list of the assumptions underlying the famous BSM model. First, it's a continuous time model with continuous trading. And what that means is within the model, you can trade any time during the day that you wish. You don't have to trade just on every five minute interval. Now, the continuous time aspect introduces lots 
of usable mathematics. So that's a very important structure. Competitive and frictionless markets. Competitive means that the traders within the model feel that they can trade, buy and sell as much of, of the asset as they wish without affecting the price. Frictionless means no transactions costs, and there are no borrowing or trading constraints that um, interfere with uh, trading. No arbitrage, interest rates are constant, no counterparty risk in the execution of financial contracts, which means that when you buy or sell securities, you are sure that the other side will complete the trade. And now this is a slightly more technical one, that the underlying risky asset price follows what's called the geometric Brownian motion. Now what does that mean? That means that if you look at the return on the asset over the next instant in time, it's random. We don't know what it's going to be. And its distribution is a bell-shaped curve, the normal distribution. And in addition, it implies that the volatility of the return is a constant. And the volatility is a measure of the variability of the stock price path if you were to graph it. Now, now those are the assumptions. And under these assumptions, the BSM model prices a derivative by, I use the words, synthetically constructing its payoffs as opposed to uh, replication. But it means the same thing. Uh, using a portfolio involving the underlying risky asset and a money market account. And the synthetic construction, by the way, that's an equation. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's not me if I don't show an equation every once in a while. So, uh, And synthetic construction, as it was mentioned, is a key insight underlying the meth methodology and all of the extensions that I'm going to talk about. So the, the germ, the, the seed for everything that I'm, I'm doing is, is that idea. Now, the BSM model works well when the BSM assumptions are satisfied. And they're very reasonable, and they apply well to, to many sorts of markets. So for short-dated options on equities and foreign currencies, short-dated, then the constant interest rate assumption is probably reasonable. In non-volatile and large volume markets, where the constant volatility and competitive structures are, are reasonable, and in markets dominated by financial institutions where frictionless and no counterparty risk uh, are reasonable. But as with any model, there are going to be times or situations when the assumptions are, are not applicable. And a couple of these here are, well, perhaps for long-dated derivatives on assets highly correlated with interest rates, then the randomness of interest rates is going to be important. Markets with less trading volume, well, we might have to worry about non-competitive markets, um, friction-filled markets, and volatile markets where asset prices do not have constant volatilities. The, the two extensions I'm going to talk about relate uh, immediately relate to the first and the last bullet point. And the last bullet point, I'm going to introduce a notion of an asset price bubble, which is well understood in the uh, professional press, but less understood in the academic world. OK. So, let, so let's go. How am I doing on time? Oh, pretty good. All right. So to deal, to extend the model to allow for stochastic interest rates, and as a footnote, to be fair, in Bob's original paper, he actually had an option pricing model where he allowed, where he uh, had stochastic interest rates. But what I'm really doing here is look at extending it to a model where we have an entire term structure of uh, default-free bonds. So you have a whole term structure of interest rates that are, that are correlated, and that whole term structure evolves over time. And that's sort of what's depicted in this, in this graph here. And so in the 1980s, I helped create the Heath Gerald Morton model, now called the HGM model. And the purpose was to price and hedge uh, interest rate derivatives. And it is based on, on Bob's original insight of synthetic construction. Now, when you develop a model, then you have to 
make sure that it actually is usable in practice. So I, I, um, well, I already talked about this, and I'm, uh, that it, the only change in the assumptions, the green one, was I just took, I kept all the other assumptions and then just included stochastic interest rates. Um, and so, yeah, I tested it myself many times with many students, and I felt it was a good um, approximation for well-traded uh, interest rate derivatives. And I have also extended my own model, um, one to include convenience yields, and this was done with Joseph Cherian, who's in the audience. And uh, at dinner last night, I was talking to Bob about the quantitative easing, and I actually introduced into this model what I call a large trader, the Federal Reserve, and then estimated the impact of quantitative easing on forward rates. And this little diagram here gives the different maturity forward rates and the impact of my estimated impact of quantitative easing on those, on those rates. All right. Now, when volatilities are not constant, crazy things can happen in arbitrage-free models. And one is an asset price bubble. Now, that little line that says bubble there should actually have a question mark next to it, and I forgot to put that in. But that's because I actually believe it was a bubble. I've done some estimation. But, but, but technically, let's put a question mark there. And that's the internet bubble um, you know, between the 1998 and two th alleged internet bubble between 1998 and, and 2000. So what is a price bubble? A price bubble is defined as a difference between the market price and the fundamental value. Well, what is the fundamental value? I define that to be the price that you would pay to hold an asset forever and never resell it. All right, so can the two be different, the market price and that? Of course, think of abstract art. I don't like it. If you ask me to buy a painting, an abstract art painting, and hold it forever, okay, I'm not gonna pay very much. but. If I believe it's valuable by others, yeah, I might buy it to retrade it. And the difference between the market price and my personal valuation, or in this case, the buy and hold forever value, that's, that's a price bubble. Now, since Bob's original work, there has been a whole field in applied mathematics that has developed. And that's called now mathematical finance. And mathematical finance is the formalization and generalization of a lot of the insights that Bob and Myron and Fisher uh, developed. And in that mathematical detail, one can show, and I say here, it has been shown that in a frictionless, competitive, and arbitrage-free market, asset price bubbles can exist. Now, that's probably surprising to many people, but it happens in a continuous time world because there are implicit borrowing constraints in the trading strategies that you allow the actors in the model to use. And they're sort of understood in economics. There's lots of literature that says that if you have constraints, then you can have values that differ, you know, fundamental values that differ from market prices. So this is sort of well understood in economics, but um, the mathematical finance literature brings, brings this out. Now, the interesting thing is that once you have bubbles in these models, all of the, the well-known results or methods that are used to price derivatives and options fail, can fail. And not surprisingly, the Black-Scholes-Merton model by construction, by this set of assumptions, excludes bubbles. So if you actually believe asset price bubbles exist, then you, you shouldn't use the black scholes merton model. Now, another common belief among economists is that you cannot detect bubbles empirically, that they're nearly impossible to detect. Well, I disagree. <laughs> so uh, I have also developed a technology, a method for identifying bubbles. And it's based on just the characteristics of the stock price or the asset price process. 
its characteristics. And one can show that uh, uh, asset price process experiencing a bubble behaves differently. Its volatility behaves differently than an asset price process that does not. And those differences can be detected. And I developed a technique. Um, and right here is the IPO of Linked in stock. And I applied the technique to this. And, and I could show statistically, according to my model, that there was a bubble there. And this is a new line of research. And like I say here, it's completely open. I'm trying to get one of my PhD students to do the estimation for me. But so far, I haven't been able to collar them. Got about five minutes, maybe 10 left. OK. Um, the structural model. All right, well, this is really an offshoot of the black scholes burton model itself. And the different assumption, although it's hard to see the color differences here, is that you replace the trading of the risky asset with now, rather than having a risky asset a stock, we think of a firm. And a firm has a balance sheet. And on the balance sheet is debt. And we want to value the firm's debt. And so to do so, we need to understand what we're going to do the synthetic construction with, because that's the way we're going to price uh, the debt. And what we're going to do is we're going to view the entire left-hand side of the balance sheet, all the assets, as trading. And we're going to think of that composite as the primary security that we're going to use to do the synthetic construction. All right, so that, that's, that's a contingent claims model. And when you do that and you do the synthetic construction, you can value the firm's debt and you can value the firm's equity. And this contingent claims analysis is very profound and has a lot of implications for all areas of uh, corporate finance. And I, I just don't have time to go into them. But what did I do differently? Well, I was interested in applying this in practice. And it bothered me because many of the firms that I looked at, I couldn't accept the assumption that all of the assets of the firm trade. You know, maybe plants or factories are not very liquid. So I, I couldn't see how you could do the synthetic construction. And so I wanted to replace that assumption. And what did we do? There was a, a collection of scholars who worked on these extensions. And we replaced that assumption with the last two here, which is we exogenously specified a default process. We, we exogenously specified a probability of default. And if default occurs, what's the recovery rate on the debt? And replacing the assets trading with these two assumptions and then using synthetic construction, oh, we also had to have something trade. And what we had was a subset of the liabilities um, that actually did trade. And using those, using the synthetic construction, um, the, 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 uh, the method extended, and we could price all sorts of instruments. And this is just a subset of those that have actually done in practice um, and felt that it was a reasonable um, approximation. All right, I'm going to. I looked at my time. I'm going to move on to um, the intertemporal capital asset pricing model, which was the, it, it gave us our understanding going from static portfolio theory to a dynamic setting, which is the setting we live in. And Again, now roughly stated, because there are many more assumptions in this structure than they are in the black scholes merton model. Um, again, continuous time, competitive and frictionless. Now we're going to have to talk a little bit and put more structures, structure on the investors that actually trade in the market. And I'm going to emphasize here symmetric beliefs and symmetric information. We're going to use equilibrium pricing rather than just no arbitrage. Equilibrium pricing means um, supply equals to demand, and that the investors are at their optimal portfolios when that happens. And what comes out of that intersection is a price. And that price is the equilibrium price. 
And we're going to give more structure to investors as well. We're going to give them what, what, we, what we call their, their preferences or, or utility function, which describes how they will make decisions. And we're going to make sure that they prefer more wealth to less and that they're risk averse. And then everything else is sort of technical so we can do the analytics. And we're going to put a nice assumption on the way asset prices move across time, which is more general than the geometric Brownian motion I mentioned earlier, but, uh, but sort of the, the finite asset uh, extension of that. And we're going to allow the volatilities themselves to be um, to random. OK, so there are, from my point of view, there are three key implications of this model for practice. A mutual fund theorem, a characterization of systematic risk, and what I call a multiple factor uh, beta model. Now, a mutual fund theorem says something like the following. If we look at an investor who's trading across many different stocks and bonds, one way to get their desired portfolio is to trade each of the individual instruments. All right? But Bob showed in this work that there's an equivalent, an easier way to do the same thing. You could just buy a small number of well-constructed mutual funds instead, buy and hold that. And that would give you the same desired position. A very powerful theorem, a very powerful notion, and, and very usable in practice. OK. Uh, characterization of systematic risk. And that's really the risk return relation. And you want to know how the expected return on different assets correspond to the risk of those assets and how to define the risk of those assets. And then the third one is more empirical. It's that, well, we don't observe expected returns, but we observe realized returns. So how do you go from expected returns to a realized return relation that, that characterizes risk as well? And so he sort of, in his paper, he had these three very important implications. And now, when I look at those assumptions, as an economist, they don't bother me, but as a practitioner, I say, well, not all of this, those assumptions are reasonable for actual markets, but yet when I look in the market anecdotally to myself, I think that these three results hold, even though I'm not sure the assumptions are valid. So I was interested in going back and kicking the assumptions and seeing if I change them, would these three results still hold? And, and to be quick about it, so the first thing I did was I kept frictionless and competitive markets and got rid of preferences and got rid of equilibrium pricing. And I looked at, at a model that just used the mathematical finance notions of no arbitrage. And lo and behold, those three implications came out, and slightly in a more general form, but they were still valid. They were robust. Okay. After doing that, I said, well, let's get rid of the frictionless and competitive part. And when I do that, what it means is that synthetic construction is no longer possible. And so I have to go to equilibrium. So I, so I went to equilibrium. And I put everything in. I mean, I just put everything in the pot. I put liquidity risk, which means that when you buy and sell, you have a quantity impact on the price. So that's sort of an endogenous transactions cost. I put in trading constraints. And then I solve for the equilibrium. And lo and behold, the three insights, again, were robust. You got the same three sort of results. Now, they were generalized because now I had, could have potentially systematic risk due to liquidity and bubbles, because bubbles can be, at least theoretically, you know, market-wide. Um, and to, this, to me, was amazing, that no matter how I kicked the model, I still got these three fundamental insights. So um, that, to me, that was sort of profound. And that's my walk away, my five minute walk away from that. Do I have time to do market efficiency? Go for it. Go for it, five minutes more? OK, I, okay thank you. The moderator says I can do it. But uh, OK, good, I will. Oh, OK. So, so how do I connect um, market efficiency with um, those fundamental insights? Well, I go back to Bob's rational option pricing theory paper. 
and in that paper, to prove many of his results relating the different types of options, he used a notion called no dominance. And no dominance is actually different technically from the notion of no arbitrage. They're related, but they're technically different. Now, I'm not gonna go into the mathematics of that, but, but roughly speaking, arbitrage, for that to work, you have to be able to do the trades. Well, sometimes, because in continuous time, you have borrowing constraints, you can't do the trade. So no dominance says that if you have two assets, A and B, and they have the same payoffs, they must have the same price. Now, if you can't do the, the cross trade to take arbitrage, this assumption says, don't worry about that. We're just going to assume that they have to have the same price. So it's sort of a weak notion of supply equaling demand because, look, if you have two assets, they have the same payoffs, different prices, who's going to hold the more expensive one? Nobody. So you can't have an equilibrium. Okay, but we're not assuming equilibrium, we're just assuming this structure, which is slightly milder. Now, Bob used that a lot. Now, mathematical finance took off, and for like 20 years, they've been doing all sorts of refinements of the notion of no arbitrage and proving theorems, and this assumption was sort of lost. Well, I remembered it because I guess I read that paper maybe two, 300 times uh, as a graduate student to try to understand it. And um, I recently proved that the assumption of no dominance is crucially important to the notion of an informa informationally efficient market, which of course was introduced by Eugene Fama. And so let me go and show you the connection. So what do we mean by an informationally efficient market? Intuitively, given an information set, the market is efficient with respect to that information set if prices fully reflect that information. So the crux, the crux here is what do we mean by fully reflect? Now in the empirical literature, that's often interpreted as being consistent with a pre-given, a specified equilibrium model. And so you want to see if the prices are consistent with that equilibrium model. And if they are, then we'd say it's efficient. If they're not, then we have the bad model problem, which, well, maybe they're not consistent with the model, with your, your testing, not because markets are inefficient, but because you chose the wrong equilibrium model. So using the ideas from mathematical finance, I wanted to formalize mathematically the definition of an efficient market. And I did it this way. Roughly speaking, I defined a market to be efficient with respect to an information set if the market prices can be supported by some equilibrium. So you have to specify a collection of equilibrium structures. That can be an, an infinite set. And the market's efficient if there is some equilibrium that supports those prices. Now the key here is existence, not the characterization, not the identification of a particular um, um, equilibrium. And given this definition, I could prove the following theorem. That a market is efficient with respect to an information set if and only if. So there exists an equilibrium that will support that price process. If and only if the market satisfies no arbitrage and no dominance. Now, I'm not going to talk about the, the, the other way, but this was an important insight to me because it then enabled me to test for market efficiency with respect to prices by just looking to see if one could prove there's no arbitrage and no dominance. And that's where mathematical finance kicks in because we have all these beautiful theorems that enables us to characterize the, the uh, no arbitrage and no dominance markets by looking at probabilistic notions of no arbitrage and no dominance. Now, surprisingly, this takes us full back. You know, I'm, starting, I'm going back to where I began, to the black scholes burton model. Because if you think about it, in an abstract sense, the black scholes burton model works when we have a, what's called a complete market. That's where you can do synthetic construction or synthetic replication. And for the Black-Scholes methodology to work, 
we actually need no arbitrage and no dominance. Okay, because I, I, mathematically, and it turns out I, I have a theorem which proves that that's equivalent to the market being efficient with respect to the, pri the information in the price process. So, wow. So the Black-Scholes-Merton technology is actually, it works if and only if the market is efficient with respect to that price information set. And the way I could prove that was going back to Bob's original paper and remembering the notion of no dominance and, and then linking together um, all this research over the many years. So, so, you know, the two Nobel Prize winners here, your work is actually connected very profoundly through this notion of no dominance. Oop, okay, done. <laughs>